Good morning. I thought for a minute I was going to have to do that last presentation again. Well, when we started this morning, Mark Clark asked if we were scientists or policymakers, and I felt like I fit somewhere in that continuum pretty well. And then I looked at our, the title of our uh, program today, Managing Dairy Nutrients, and I thought, did I get to the wrong meeting? Uh, but I, I'm getting a lot more out of this than I'm afraid I'm going to impart to you. But I think as you see the presentation, you'll see that I have a lot of interaction with some of the people that are in this room. So we are connected. I'd like to talk about who and where we are, talk about some of the factors that affected our change. I'd like to tell you it's because of uh, great management skills, uh, visionary leadership, but uh, it has more to do with being in the right place at the right time and some external factors. And uh, I think those are interesting and I'd like to share them with you. I'd like to talk about our water quality and water conservation program and tell you how we're on to a new journey now, uh, the lower Yakima Valley uh, groundwater management area. Most of you know that the uh, Yakima Basin watershed is in eastern Washington, starts at the top of the Cascades at Snoqualmie Pass and runs to the Columbia River in Richland. The uh, Sunnyside Division is in the, uh, generally the lower end of that watershed. You see up to the left, we're just uh, about 10 miles downstream of Yakima, about 20 miles from the Tri-Cities. Now I will talk about the Sunnyside Division, I'll talk about Sunnyside Valley Irrigation District, I'll use the acronym SVID. For purposes today, they're all one and the same. Uh, the Sunnyside, there once was uh, uh, 14 entities in the Sunnyside Division through some mergers, consolidations, we've reduced that substantially, but Sunnyside Valley Irrigation has always been the predominant entity and today it's 95% of the total acreage. So, Our nexus to the federal government is through the Department of Interior. We work with the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, it has, I think it's seven regions serving uh, irrigation projects in the 17 western states in Hawaii. <coughs> oh, excuse me, we're in the northwest, Pacific Northwest region. Uh, in the Columbia Cascade Area Office, which is generally or primarily Washington and Oregon. And of course, the Yakima Reclamation Project serves the Yakima Basin. There are seven uh, divisions of the Yakima Project, the Storage Division, and uh, the six irrigation uh, divisions. We're a unit of local government, uh, special purpose district, I report to a five-member board of directors. Uh, Doug Simpson is a, uh, raises mint and raises a lot of forage crops for dairies. Mike Hogue is a apple farmer, uh, grows wine grapes. Dave Michaels grows uh, cherries, apples, and mint. And Bill Skeenstrand and uh, Kevin Golub are dairymen. So uh, let's talk about how we got from the 19th century to the 21st century in a uh, fairly uh, quick time. It uh, is partly because of tribal fishing rights, because we have senior water rights, because of some pretty severe droughts, uh, court mandates, and uh, changing public policy some federal legislation, a water rights settlement, and most importantly to all of that is a progressive board of directors. Uh, in 1855, Governor Stevens uh, negotiated a treaty with the uh, Yakimas, and at about the same time this was happening with other tribes in Washington. And there was a pretty common language, that, or typical language that said uh, uh, the Indians would have the right to fish in common with the, the European settlers. They may have known what that meant at the time, but 100 years later, we weren't so sure what that meant. 
Another factor is uh, the fact that the state of Washington operates under the prior appropriation doctrine, like most of the western states. And uh, maybe I should just digress for a minute. The Sunnyside uh, Canal was built by the Northern Pacific Railroad, uh, started, uh, made delivery starting in 1892. And in 19... Uh, 05, the federal government came into the Yakima Basin, created the Sunnyside Division, bought out the system and created the Sunnyside Division, and uh, filed for a withdrawal of all unappropriated rights in the Yakima Basin. Well, I think what was intended was that the, when the federal government bought out the uh, existing irrigation companies, or dis, uh, yeah, companies, it was presumed that they would all have the May 10, 1905 priority date. But in one of those interesting cases of uh, unintended consequences, Sunnyside and the federal government got into an extensive and bitter uh, court case that started in 1930 and ended up in 1945. And it was over uh, the extent of the water rights in the Sunnyside uh, project and uh, their priority and over the repayment of uh, adding additional construction costs to the Sunnyside project. And it ended up completely turned around into providing uh, Sunnyside, putting Sunnyside and a couple of other, a few other entities in very good stead uh, from a water rights standpoint. And what happened was it, um, the consent judgment ended up with those rights that were pre-1905 as non-proratable rights, and uh, those May 10, 10 rights were proratable, meaning uh, in times of shortage, the non-proratable entities would get their water, and then the remaining water would be prorated among the others. And, and Sunnyside having 1890 rights, some 1893 rights, uh, ended up with about two-thirds of its water supply as non-proratable rights. And so uh, having one of the biggest blocks of uh, senior rights, non-proratable rights. We had a series of water shortages. The first really severe one was 1977. Not that there weren't uh, shortages pre before this time, but these were the first to occur after the build out of the Yakima project. Well, I mentioned earlier tribal rights and what that fishing rights and what that meant exactly. Uh, and in 1974, Judge Bolt ruled that the tribes were entitled to half of the harvestable fish. And then in 1978, in the Bolt II, uh, he found that Washington had an obligation to protect the environment for fish to propagate. So what that meant was uh, the state, although always supportive of water resources uh, management generally, now had an obligation uh, together with uh, emerging public policy that was much more uh, environmental in nature. Now the state was actively involved in finding a way to solve some water supply issues in the, prime, in the Yakima Basin and other places. In 1994, the, uh, Congress passed the Yakima River Basin Water Enhancement Project Act. This was a uh, significant departure in federal reclamation uh, programs in that uh, it provided 65% uh, federal funding, the state matched it with 17 and a half percent and the uh, participating entity uh, also uh, particip uh, paid 17 and a half percent. But with that uh, very attractive funding package, the participating entity had to give up two-thirds of the conserved water. Uh, this wasn't something that just happened. Uh, we had been, uh, Sunnyside had been involved in feasibility studies for the prior seven or eight years because it was obvious, although this was generic legislation, it was, pa it was uh, 
the sunny side division was the place where it could have the most impact. impact. A, a big block of senior water rights, uh, an older district, one that would be interested in modern, modernizing its system. And so uh, it just was fit for our, our particular application. In 1995, if you'll notice, some of these things are after, happening after the last drought, uh, or the drought of 1992 to 94 drought. In 1995, the Sunnyside Division and the Rose Irrigation District got into serious talks about finding ways to address droughts. And it was between the haves and the have-nots. So there was some uh, significant interest in the Rosa project to see if they could pay for system improvements. Those system improvements would provide water savings that could be transferred to Rosa. That was one objective uh, in hence water supplies. Another was to improve water quality, although, although I must admit that was a lot further down on the list. And then one thing as a manager I thought was a great idea was to uh, achieve greater uh, operational efficiencies. Well, um, during the same time period, there became a great awareness of uh, water quality issues. And uh, the state uh, ecology and uh, EPA uh, set a goal, uh, a TMDL goal for turbidity on the lower Yakima River. And the discussions about how the two entities, Rosa and Sunnyside, would work together to move some water to Rosa really wasn't going anywhere. And I, the feeling was uh, there was two things that got the entities involved in water quality. And one was in order to be effective in talking to others about uh, water conservation and transfers, we had to have more credibility. Uh, that we were uh, credible water resource managers. The second thing was uh, just a typical uh, response, whether it's farmers or others, who are not too excited about ecology coming in and handling a uh, water quality program within our boundaries. And so uh, the, the two organizations under the umbrella of the Rosa Sunnyside Board of Joint Control decided to create the uh, a water quality department and uh, address that TMDL. Well, I'm sure a lot of people thought what do irrigation districts know about a water quality program. The fortunate thing was uh, ecology was extremely supportive. They were very helpful, uh, helped us uh, set up a lab. They helped us get it certified. And uh, we had another friend, and some of you would know Stuart McKenzie, who was with USGS out of Portland, but he actually is from the Yakima Valley and had a lot of interest in uh, what was going on in the Yakima Valley. And he kind of took us under his wing, and he monitored, monitored this uh, gentleman in the lower left-hand corner. He was our wa first water quality uh, manager. And Stu spent a lot of voluntary time uh, helping us set up the program and, and giving it the credibility that it needed to be successful. Well, this took a proactive approach uh, by the uh, two boards because um, heretofore, irrigation districts didn't really tell their landowners what to do. We took the water out of the river, we diverted it, distributed it to the farms, and then the soil conservation districts, somebody other than us said, here's what you do. We got into a program where we're actually regulating the uh, water users, although we didn't use the word regulate. We said we had guidelines uh, because regulation was not a good word to use, but we <coughs> we were monitoring the runoff from all of the farms, and we took what got characterized as the soft glove approach. We nudged people along slowly enough that they didn't react too negatively, and we started out 
the first year, anyone with a discharge of over 4,000 NTUs, they got a citation, letter, whatever you want to call it from us, and they had to take corrective action. Second year, it went down to 2,000 NTUs, the third year down to 1,000. And before we knew it, we were making real progress in water quality. This shows in 1997, up in the upper left corner, how uh, that you can see the silt plume coming out of Sulphur Creek Wasteway, which is just south of Sunnyside. Same location, same date, and 2000 showing the silt plume is gone. This photo, I think, was actually taken by the Conserva South Yakima Conservation District. I don't know. I think Lori Crow has a plane she flies around to meetings in, and she took the picture. I don't know. It just I, I don't remember the history, but anyway, someone else took the photo, which kind of gives it more credibility, I suppose. And this shows graphically what we did. Uh, we essentially removed 95% of the total suspended solids uh, discharged into the Yakima River from four of our drains, our four major drains discharged into the Yakima River. You can see the red line is the uh, 25 NTUs, and we've bumped around real close to it, uh, but it's been uh, highly successful. And in fact, I have to tell a little story about myself is that, uh, well, I won't. I'll just say I was surprised how well it turned out. Uh, in uh, 2003, uh, we had an ongoing adjudication, started in 1979, and uh, finally the number of, of the major plaintiffs decided they need to reach a negotiated, or not plaintiffs, defendants decided we needed a ne negotiated settlement. And so we had a settlement uh, between the Yakima Nation, the state of Washington, the federal government. Uh, and the, all the issues were important, but the one that's relevant to our discussion today was a commitment to the Yakima River Basin Water Enhancement Project. He committed us to participate in that project and to the extent that the state and the federal government could obligate themselves, they committed to funding it. So let me just talk about the conservation program for a minute. First phase was autom automating the Sunnyside Canal. That involved uh, three re-regulating re reservoirs, construction of 30 uh, automated gates or check structures, and then a SCADA system to tie that all together so that we could not only control, uh, monitor, but control our gates and pool elevations remotely. And then phase two was an enclosed lateral improvement projects, enclosing our major laterals so that we could provide gravity uh, pressure uh, to some of our landowners, and maybe more importantly, we could uh, allow them to take water on a demand basis or a modified demand basis so they could take the water when they needed to turn it off when they didn't need it so we didn't have excess water being applied to the land. And having flow meters at the point of delivery made it possible to uh, more accurately measure that water. The results of that water quality and water conservation program is that we were able to improve on-farm management. The water conservation or water quality program really was what drove that because when we sent out a water uh, violation notice, uh, that really f encouraged, forced uh, uh, folks to tra uh, change from real irrigation to uh, sprinkler or drip irrigation. And again, uh, Ecology came forward and loaned us uh, money through the state revolving fund which we in turn uh, loan that money to farmers so they could upgrade their systems. This just shows the trend from uh, real irrigation, or from sprinkler, it was about 55%, and at the end of 2012, it was over 70%. The next line shows the decreasing real irrigation, and then finally, the we don't have a lot of drip irrigation just because of our cropping uh, mix. Uh, so they, uh, the results of participating in that uh, conservation, or conservation program 
reduced our diversion entitlement from about four and a half acre feet down to four acre feet, which puts us as the lowest in the basin, except for uh, Yakima Titan Irrigation District, which is a fully enclosed system, a smaller, smaller system. And this shows graphically what both water quality and water conservation is. This is our actual uh, diversion reduction. So to summarize, uh, the diversions, our first phase, we saved, uh, we put 29,000 acre feet of water back to the lower Yakima River, phase two, uh, about 4,000 acre feet. Might just note that phase 2A, we got ARA funding for that, so we were really busy there for a while doing both the canal automation and the enclosed lateral system. We're in a phase now where we'll save an additional 3,000 acre feet, uh, and we hope over the last phase to do another 10,000. Just for perspective, we have returned <coughs> about 35,000 acre feet annually to the Yakima River below the Sunnyside Dam. Our smallest reservoir in the Yakima project is Bumping Lake, has 33,000 acre feet, so it's a big block of water. I point out this slide. Last year was the first, this is uh, above Clay Allen Reservoir and the first time in over, I don't know what it is, 80 or 100 years, sockeye salmon returned to this area to spawn. It was a pretty emotional, emotional and exciting event for the tribe and fishery interests and uh, demonstrates what a, all, a lot of different folks have been inv involved in. I think this captures at best a quote from a staff member of the tribe said a couple of years ago, I think people have become more aware of the salmon problem. It's a lot of people doing a lot of small things that improve the environment for salmon. We don't take all the credit for the improvement and uh, the re restoration of the salmon resource, but we would like to think that we've been a part of it. Looking ahead quickly, we have a Guama in the lower Yakima Valley. Uh, the Rosa Sunnyside uh, Board of Joint Control participates because we are, those are uh, the lands uh, in the Rosa Sunnyside Valley uh, Irrigation District service boundaries. The Groundwater Management Committee uh, involves a lot of different uh, stakeholders. That's not by accident. I picked that that uh, photo. It's uh, kind of been a challenge because there's a lot of very interest. Uh, we have different chairs. Some of the people are here today that are uh, participants. Uh, Charlie McKinney has the Livestock CAFO group. Uh, I thought I was just going to be a fly on the wall in this whole process and I ended up being chair of the Ar Irrigated Agriculture Committee, but I have to say that I uh, got a lot of talented people at work on that committee. Uh, Tom Eaton's here today and he's also part of one of the chairs. So our whole process is to better manage a, a scarce resource. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Come on now, Jeannie, or Jenny, don't embarrass me with a tough question. <laughs> I was just curious on the on-demand system for the delivery. What percentage of the deliveries? I mean, I know they've been working for several years on that, but what's the percentage of that that are actually? Probably 25 at the moment, and we hope to get up to about 75 before we're done. Uh, it's still coming from uh, system, system efficiencies, delivery system and efficiencies. Do you have any projection about what, what's possible on, on conservation? Well, it's happening. We haven't, that gets to be in kind of a touchy subject as far as what their water right is, and so we don't really quantify that, but it's obvious that 
the things we're doing make it possible for them to improve their application efficiency. Any other questions for Jim? So Tom just a minute ago was talking about the real and the Central Valley and flood. If you had to make a wild guess, the irrigation efficiency differences between the real and the center pivot sprinkler type systems, what would you say? I mean, I, I assume a portion of that 35,000 you put back in the river came from those on-farm conservation activities put on a you know, two acre foot, three acre foot. What do you see in for a, a, a drop in use of the farmers or using less of water on the farm themselves? Well, if you just go to the Washington Irrigation Guide, I think uh, it uh, considers uh, uh, irrigation application of efficiency for real to be about 50 percent, and then sprinklers from 70 to 90 percent, 70 to 80 percent. So it's substantial. Um, I don't know in terms of acre feet. I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me as be in the range of a half an acre foot. Thank you very much.